Hey guys, nobody here. It's 10 in the morning, and I'm gonna put some game footage or something up in the background. It's not really relevant to the discussion. In fact, I'm not really reading off anything. I'm just gonna start talking and go. Um, and this is, oh, I guess what you could call a defense for modded gaming, which in a way you don't really need to hear because I, you shouldn't need to defend mo uh, modifying a pro or a product that you bought in essence because that's what it is i mean it, we're not talking about you know distributing an entirely new product and making money off of it we're talking about you know opening or we're talking about you know adding something to your specific copy of a game and distributing it for free if someone else wants it you're not making money off of it you're not profiting off of it in any way this is very much a labor of love because it was something that you thought you could do or put into a game that would make it more fun and you found it fun so you decided to uh, distribute it so other people could enjoy it like you could and you know you shouldn't have to defend that you know it's kind of like in a way modifying a game is very much akin to painting a car or buying a phone case maybe not buying a phone case but you know painting your car or i don't know add rearranging your house it's a good one uh modifying your house uh remodeling your house that's very excellent uh, comparison actually and i'll go into why um in remodeling and adding on to your house is something that my family actually did uh We've used to have a carpet now, a floor downstairs. Now it's tile and wood. Um, granted, the tile was there, but we're going to replace that tile eventually. Uh, we used to have a very big backyard, and now it's kind of filled with a uh, what they call, or what my dad calls, the addition, which is basically a hurricane shelter that he's converted into a game room. Um, but. You know, that's very much akin to modifying a game because we'll take one of my... We'll, we'll take the game that everyone can know of. We'll take Minecraft, right? Um, <laughs> you can modify that game in many ways, starting with resource packs, which change the textures and the sounds in the game uh, from, the base mod from the base files. Um, you know, it's like replacing the wood floor and... how It's like replacing the carpet floor and housing into... Uh, in your house more or less and there's no law preventing you from doing that in fact a lot of people are encouraging you to remodel your house uh, if you have the spare cash because apparently it makes you more inclined to want to hold on to your home i don't know um i'm not a psychologist <laughs> but um it's it, comparing that to minecraft it's very much akin to finding a new texture for the grass that you want to look at and replacing that or replace finding a new texture pack for the game and replacing that you know it's it's new it doesn't fundamentally change anything about the game like it doesn't i guess in a sense you know it doesn't fundamentally change anything about the house it's not adding a room you know you're not fundamentally changing anything about the game you're not adding anything to the game in this specific instance you're just you know changing the way it looks but if we and we'll take that concept and apply it to the other side of modding which is adding things into the game or changing things in the game and we can apply that to adding on to the house like building a hurricane shelter um you're adding on to your house granted you need you know permits and money and time and things to do that but you're doing it for yourself mostly you're not building a hurricane how or not building a hurricane shelter for everyone to come to you're building it for yourself and other people might get the idea and you might be willing to do it for them for money but that you, i'm overextending the comparison there 
Whereas in Minecraft, for example, we add new blocks into the game and they do different things. Like you can add pumps to remove water. You can add quarries to increase the speed of your mining. You can change the amount of materials that you can pull out of the ground. You can change the types of weapons you can use. You know, you, there's fundamentally a lot you can do in that game if you modify it, which is where most of I personally feel the enjoyment comes from. But I can understand how some might not be interested in changing the core game, and that's fine too, you know, however you get your kicks. But you might be wondering why I'm even discussing this. Well, yesterday I was hanging out with some friends, and I pulled out my phone, and I'm browsing through the YouTube subscriptions, and I saw a video, and I can't remember, I think it was, was it Monday and Matt who did a video on it? I don't know. Um, but there was a video of one of the YouTubers that I'm subscribed to, and he was talking about the DMCA that was issued to Open4, which is a software used to modify the game Grand Theft Auto 5 and 4, I believe, but I have most of my experience with it from modding GTA 5. Um, that's a, no, it was, uh, Nerd Cubed. That's who it was. Um... That said, he made a very good point, being that is the backbone, modding is the backbone of a game's longe longevity, longevity, I don't know exactly which one I would pick, but we'll just go with longevity and hope that I'm not being, you know, stupid. But, um... If you happen to be a video game developer watching this, which God knows no one's going to bother watching my channel, but I feel like this is something I'm very passionate about. Modding games was something that I started doing when I was a kid. Um, and I played uh, Command & Conquer General Zero Hour. And the modding scene for that... The modding scene for that game in particular was... At the time, I thought it was huge. I was like, oh my god, there are so many mods that I can try. Little did I, you know, know what all of them did, and some of them weren't, you know, adding new units. Because at the time, modding to me was adding things to the game, which, you know, opened a whole new world for me. It was completely out of the box thinking. I was like, you can put things in games that aren't supposed to be there? Oh, yeah. Where's my Star Wars mod? You, you know, that was... <laughs> that was pretty much my first uh, response. But when I didn't find one, I settled on the Contra and Shockwave mods, which I loved. And then there was... Uh, what was it? Um, Destructive Forces, which was a really cool one. But, you know, the, the point was... Modding really increased the lifespan of that game for me. To this day, I'll still pop that game in all change a mod around and I will give it a go and I'll spend like three or four days just dicking around in that game because I don't know it's entertaining I can honestly say that if I couldn't mod that game I probably wouldn't play it as much if at all and that can be said for many of the games that are in my collection um, with almost a thousand hours in Gary's Mod, which is a game built upon the premise of modifying the game to be what you want it to be, I have found the thing that attracts me to games the most. And if I look at every game that I spend all my... the most amount of time in, you know, the games that I will go to my friends and I will tell them, hey, you need to play this. These, this is a life-changing experience. This was really impactful for me like knights of the old republic was one of those games left for dead was actually one of those games yeah it was really fun i had never left for dead opened me to the world of you know involved co-op experiences so it was a very fun time for me or uh command and conquer you know i introduced a lot of my friends to the real-time strategy genre and made a lot of good friends based off of my knowledge in the real-time strategy genre um skyrim oh god skyrim I have collectively about 500 hours in that game, and at least 260 of it are because I was modding everything in that game. I was adding new quests, new items, new weapons, new armors. I turned it into a survival mode because Frostfall and Campfire, come on, those are like staples now. 
Bethesda, you should have put that in the main game, but point aside, you know, modding adds so much you can do with these games. It will, it cannot drive sale, or, it, it, sorry, I'm stepping over my words. I'm not saying that it can't drive sales. What I'm saying is, you can't get a solid number, and I believe Nerd Cube said this, and... But you really can't get a solid number on how much modding actually sells a game, because the modding scene doesn't really, you know, kick into high gear until about a year, two years, maybe three, after the game's, you know, been out over and done with, and most games are out of the spotlight in six months, and if it's Call of Duty, maybe three weeks, but... You know, everyone who buys the game specifically for the mods picks the game up usually on sale or after the fact, long after, you know, all the important tracking data and sales for the game, aside from maybe, you know, lifetime sales and, um, you know, five-year estimates, uh, would keep track of. Um, so, not a lot of people really have a big, you know, idea of how how many people are buying the game specifically for modding. And, sorry, um, I'm going to cut out a lot of my pauses and a lot of my silence, uh, long silence moments while I'm thinking. Um, so if it's a little bit cut up in places, I apologize. Uh, but, well, I bring this up because this whole thing with Grand Theft Auto, I play Grand Theft Auto 5, I have about 160 hours sunk into that game. It's not a game that I modded a lot of, but I can understand the appeal of modding it. To me, I don't mod it as much because it's kind of complicated for me to do so, and the game's updated a lot, so it breaks a lot, so... For me, modding a game usually comes after all the major updates are pushed out, and probably for a lot of people, uh, so you don't have to worry about breaking the game. And there are a few exceptions to this, such as um, Kerbal Space Program, which I'll be getting to in a bit. But we're talking about Grand Theft Auto right now, and Take-Two Interactive issuing this DMCA. And I feel like they're shooting themselves in the foot, in a way. Because Rockstar has been a very open and supportive uh, company when it comes to modding, or at least they tend to play that front. Whether they actually believe that or not, I can't say, but I'd like to believe they do. And this DMCA really kind of came out of nowhere. I didn't believe that it would happen, and it was issued, as I understand, under the pretense of allowing changes to the game that could compromise its security, which, okay, but are we talking about security online? Because, I'm sorry, Take-Two Interactive, but just attacking OpenIV, or Open4, I'm sorry, I call it OpenIV, uh, I don't know, when I see no Roman numerals, I just read IV or II or IX. Most people probably do, or but, you know, open for. I, I, when I look at this, I don't see that. I, I see that as a very blanket excuse. I can't, I can't buy that. Because attacking open for, for being able to allow people to access, or for security reasons, because I don't, fully recall what the details were. It doesn't make sense to me. Like, okay, yeah, fine. If you want to, you know, stop people hacking the online community or the online game, yeah, I can understand because, you know, it's filled with fucking hackers. But setting that aside, that's not the way to go about it because Open 4 is used for the trainer, which is what a lot of people use. But you should just disable mods online. Or find a way to disable mods online. Because if... Really, I think this is kind of illegal. Or this has to be... 
I don't think they can legally do this. And the online scene, maybe, but for the single player element, which Open 4 is mainly used for, because it's used for adding vehicles and player models and different guns and skins, and, you know, it's used for the trainer, which I really think is the thing that people use a lot in hacking, but you can, you can find other ways around that. It's not the only way to hack that game, believe me, I know. I'm not a hacker, but I do know some people who, I, one person in particular who is, and point in case, open IV is not the way he gets into the game. I know I'm a horrible person, but it's that aside. Attacking modding, a sing attacking the single, attacking a predominantly single player modded community because you want to tackle security issues on the online component doesn't make sense to me at all. It really just feels very it feels like it's very malice driven very we want to sink our claws into this untapped monetization stream because you're doing things for free and we can't have that because you're doing things that aren't let that's not letting us get money even though people are buying the game and for Grand Theft Auto 5, they pulled in over a billion dollars last year alone because of that release. I don't understand why attacking a single player modded community because they're not monetizing their things. Does it it feels very hateful to me. And you know, I am just kind of speculating because let it be known, I am saying now and regardless of what I may hint at in this video, I cannot s truly state what their intentions are. I can only speculate. But I'm speculating that this is more than just because of security reasons. Predominantly because I just don't... I, 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 I can't under... The, the connection between Open 4 and the online component of GTA 5 just doesn't make sense to me because I remember when that first started out people were just getting banned outright because they had mods on their single player and Rockstar came out and said that no this was a mistake this isn't what we want you to do we just don't want them online this is how that works so I don't understand why take two is suddenly just like nope nope can't open IV anymore nope uh-uh gotta gotta stop that part of me thinks I'm just kind of you know thinking now it might have something to do with that giant project to port Liberty City over into Grand Theft Auto V. It might have something to do with that because Open IV is required for that, and technically you have to buy a copy of Grand Theft Auto IV to do that. So I don't understand what they're. I don't understand it. <laughs> the ramblings of a nobody, people. <laughs> <clears throat> but. Let's move on, because I've said most of my piece on Grand Theft Auto V. I don't think it makes sense. I think they're just being dicks, and we shouldn't stand for this as a community, as a gaming community. But I mentioned Kerbal Space Program earlier. Kerbal Space Program is a game that's updated somewhat frequently, but not enough to break all the mods all the time. So I find it very easy to get a nice little pack of mods going that I can play with and I can just run with that for like a month or two and I'll be fine and then I can leave for like another six or seven months and come back like three or four updates later because for some reason that happens in the time span that I've stopped playing and I can start all over and things are fun but Take-Two Interactive recently acquired Squad the developers of Kerbal Space Program and with this move against Open 4, Open IV it leaves me very worried and very it feeling like I waste a little wasted a lot of money in this game. And twenty three bucks is a lot of money to me because I bought this game back when it was in beta. I bought it April twenty thirteen, so I was lucky enough to be in that group that gets the DLC for free for as long as they release DLC. Yay me! But The fact that Take-Two acquired this company and acquired this game 
that is built on a foundation. Kerbal Space Program very much is a fun game to play by itself, but the modding community for Kerbal Space Program is absolutely massive. Many people, myself included, find it almost impossible to play the game without mech jeb because autopiloting maneuvers for multiple spacecraft at a time make flying missions a lot easier. But if, you know, Take-Two Interactive gets their hands, or starts getting, you know, their corporate hands in the way Squad does their modding, or modding community modding business, I'm very worried about the future of this game, because it's a very mod-driven game. It is very much a case, very much like Minecraft, where the lifespan of this game is driven predominantly because of the modding community behind it. It's very much... Even Squad themselves have backed the uh, curse modding or curse modding page that Kerbal Space Program has as the number one place to stock up on mods for that game. Now that said, with Take Two's acquisition of Squad Entertainment, I am very very worried that they're going to start uh, changing the way Squad does things in terms of the modding community and how things go about their business because if they can't monetize it and they can't get a cut back of all that free fun that people are getting they might just start DMCAing Squad and or Squad not Squad Curse they might start DMCAing Space Dock they might start DMCAing many of these other uh, forum pages that hold those backhand mods that you really have to search for to find the true gems buried in the dirt you know, it's it's kind of a frightening time to be a PC gamer, if I'm being honest. Many of the things, or many of the things that we do, that we lay claim to as being some of the best reasons to support our platform or become a patriot of the quote-unquote PC master race, if you want to call it that, are under attack now because companies are starting to get greedy. And I don't think it's right. Now, my opinion on being able to monetize your mods is one that... Honest to God, I really can't justify not being able to make money for doing something that you love and doing something that you're good at. And many of these people who make these mods for these games are very talented, very, very, very hardworking individuals that do these entirely out of love, off of the basis of never receiving monetary compensation, working another day job, having a family, having a social life. They do this for fun. And they are very underappreciated, no matter how much love they get. They, I feel like they deserve more, but unfortunately, the environment in which they're working doesn't really have a viable solution at the current moment. So I'm against paid mods, if only because a better alternative to the two that I've been shown so far, both from Bethesda, I might add, and the first one with Bethesda and Valve and their Steam Workshop paid mods, and then what Bethesda's trying to do with their E3 presentation. You know, it's I'm all very much not for it. That said, I would love to see an environment in which modders could make money off of their hard work and effort because I feel like they've gone underappreciated and I just haven't seen a viable option yet. Now, I do think that Bethesda's attempt at um, creating a paid mods... Uh, or a pay for mods, uh, you know, environment is a step in the right direction because I very much think the biggest issue is that mods very much oftentimes are incompatible with each other. And if you're paying for things that you think are going to work together and they wind up not working together, or they wind up being abandoned or just not developed further, you know, it's just kind of a catch-22, because you'd think if you were able to pay them or provide them monetary compensation, people would be able to, you know, come back and maintain them under the guise of, well, now they're getting something for it, but at the same time, they might not. You know, you kind of have to worry what the outcome could be, because it could go many, many different ways, and it's kind of very much a very faith and trust scenario in which this would work at the current moment. I just feel like there's a lot of issues with mods in general, but I think that the 
option that they have, which was they're going to work very closely and go through a validation process to make sure that they're going to work with the game and always work with the game and work with anything else you might add. I think that's a very cool idea. I want that to work, but I don't think that the way they're doing it is a good idea because horse armor, mud crab, you know. I worry that a lot of the things that would wind up on that, you know, particular... Uh, cutting block or a particular chopping block wouldn't be um as high quality as they should be or would be lacking in uh what they promised to do or would just be abandoned outright you know i don't because you're not working with a game i used to think that working with a game developer meant quality but i even can't i can't even say that anymore <sighs> that's a sad thought moving on I honestly don't know where to go from here. I think that Take Two's being. F I think that Take Two's full of themselves. I think that they really need to take a long look at what they're doing in the long run because at the end of the day, they're not going to get an untapped monetization stream if they try to slap down a paid mods scheme after doing this, what they're going to wind up doing is killing any future modding community their games might have, which in turn, whether you want to admit it or not, is going to take a very big smack into your... Or very, it's going to make a very large dent in any potential profits you might make down the future because people aren't going to trust you. And I'd like to finish this little ramble with one anecdotal, but kind of not anecdotal, um, piece of information that's kind of been sitting in the back of my head. Um, this is very, very, very reminiscent of something Nintendo tried to do back in the 90s with homebrew cartridges and modifying game code. Uh, and I believe it was with a Castlevania game, but I could be wrong. Um, but Nintendo actually took someone to court over modifying their game cartridge. Uh, I think they were making a new game out of it and, you know, like, showing it to people. But I believe, if my memory serves, the uh, ruling in the court was that once you buy the game, it's yours and you can do whatever you want with it. So, as long as you're not making money off of it... Um, yeah. You really can't do anything to stop someone from modifying their game. It's just, it's not right. I'm pretty sure it's illegal, which is why I said that earlier. Uh, I could be wrong, though. But these are just my thoughts on the topic. And I know I said I'd finish with that, but I'm a rambler. It's in my name, so I'm going to finish with this. Modding in games is a very, very important part of the gaming community. And in fact, I will just run down a list of every game in my Steam library that supports modding that I play because I can mod them. And just to finish before I run down the list. I play these games not just because modding them, because I find fun in them. I found fun in them before I started modding them. But the fact that they have a modding community, the fact that it's this open, and the fact that I can do this many things with these games really keeps bringing me back. It keeps me wanting to play them. It honestly keeps me interested in if there ever may be a sequel down the road, because another thing on top of... Uh, Another thing that I think game developers should really start doing is looking at mods that people put in games for ideas to put in your sequels. Because while some of them very much are lore breakable, like the Star Wars lightsabers in Skyrim, some of the things that you can see and some of the things that you might find might give you some honest ideas and better opinions about where to take your games in the future. Like the Frostfall and uh, Campfire mods for Skyrim. If you were to add a survival element to the next Elder Scrolls game, it would it would honestly turn that entire game series 
on its head. It would... Oh. Having a survival element in a land like Skyrim where it's supposed to be cold, harsh, and you're supposed to be, you know, everyone's supposed to be surviving in basically a painful, freezing winter, it really adds a whole new level of gameplay and depth to wanting to continue on my quest. You really should take a look at, you know, what a lot of people want for these games, because modding will tell you a lot about what your game is missing and what your game does right. But with that said, this is the list of all the games that I play that I can mod that I play because I can mod them and I enjoy modding them. Age of Empires 2 HD edition, Age of Empires 3 the complete collection, Chris Sawyer's Locomotion, City Skylines, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, Skyrim, Skyrim Special Edition, Executive Assault I do not play because of mods, it's sorry. Factorio, Gary's Mod, Grand Theft Auto V, Kerbal Space Program, Left 4 Dead 2, Lego Star Wars The Complete Saga. I can mod that. Believe it or not, you can find some really interesting things for the Lego games if you look hard enough. Like, all of the additional Lego characters from all the Lego games that have been ported, and it's really fun. Ugh. The Mass Effect series, Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3. The texture mods for those games make them, oh, so amazing to look at. Mountain Blade Warband is a game literally built upon the ability to mod it, so the Mountain Blade series, modding those games, amazing. In fact, the Mountain Blade series is actually kind of an example of modding done right, or monetization modding done right, because what they did was there was a mod, I think it was Britain Walia, that they wound up uh, hiring the developers of that mod and allowing them to publish it and sell it on the Steam work page as, I think, uh, Vikings Conquest whatever and it's they get most of the money from that like that's I, I think that's a great idea because it was a well done it was a well done mod but the thing with mountain blade is all the mods are like all inclusive you're not really combining things you're just kind of creating a whole new game out of it so it's a little bit easier to do that anyway parkitect planet coaster Roller Coaster Tycoon as a series. Sonic Generations, the KOTOR series. In fact, most Star Wars games are great for modding. There's a lot of stuff you can do in Star Wars, like Battlefront 2, Empire at War, Galactic Battleground Saga, the KOTOR games. I can mo I mod those all the time. I've modded a lot of those. Team Fortress 2 is a game with a community not built on modding, but a community built on adding things to the game. So if you want to call the workshop for Team Fortress 2 modding, sure, but most of that just becomes part of the base game anyway. So Torchlight is a game built upon modding. Then the workshop looks a lot of fun. I haven't played that yet, but I intend to take a look at that at some point down the road. Bioshock and Bioshock 2, I've still looked at the modding communities. They're not that great yet, but... I would love to see some really great texture replacements for those games. Command and Conquer Generals, Half-Life, Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2 Episode 1, Episode 2, Just Cause 2. <laughs> the Portal games. Most of the mods for the Portal games are just like additional like test chambers and stories and whatnot. Railroad Tycoon. And finally, the Jedi Knight games. I have a lot of games on my Steam. Most of those, and that's just like all the games that I have on my Steam profile. There are many other games that I have, like Minecraft that I mentioned earlier, that I mod. SimCity, The Sims. I've ranted and rambled long enough. This is mostly just a discussion on why I think mods are important to video games. I know I said it was a defense of modding, but it's more just a discussion of why I think mods are important and where I think they fit in the grand scheme of gaming. But, um... Let me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts on modding. Aside from that, this is Nobody, and thank you for listening. I'm out.